thank you to the organizers uh, and the sponsor of this symposium, Nestle, for this opportunity to come and share uh, some of our, our thinking and, and research um, in this area. Uh, I'm going to discuss the importance of carbohydrate quality over quantity uh, for cardiometabolic health and the role of processing in food form uh, within that. So these are my uh, disclosures. Um, I've been trained by uh, David Jenkins, so I put up all disclosures from intellectual to financial to familial. Uh, I've been involved with some guidelines work, um, which is given uh, guidelines as it relates to carbohydrate uh, quantity and quality. And so those uh, conflicts are, are, are there, um, as well as uh, receiving food and, and donations for a number of uh, trials that we're doing and, uh, and uh, honoraria. And I always say my most important conflict is my wife, as she works for uh, AB InBev. <clears throat> uh, so with that, uh, a bit of background. For example, wheat belly and grain brain, big fat surprise from Nina T. Colts, um, you know, the case against sugars and um, good calories, bad calories by Gary Taubes, fat chance by Robert Lustig and so on, and as well as a number of, of articles and, and particularly uh, important uh, framers of the news, uh, such as some of the uh, such as Time magazine and um, the, the Telegraph in London and so on. <clears throat> um, the. Uh, Oh, there's been a, quite a bit of research and interest in uh, the biological plausibility that underpins this as it relates to the carbohydrate insulin model. I don't have a lot of time, uh, really time to go through that. Uh, but suffice to say, despite though, though, those uh, trials by Kevin Hall and, and David Ludwig showing uh, really what is mixed results as it relates to the carbohydrate insulin model as, as really the biological plausibility that underpins this. And um, shorter term studies, which have shown some evidence of superiority of, of lower carbohydrate diets, um, really, when one looks at the longer term trials uh, that allow for uh, spontaneous changes in intake and activity level um, and are more free living, uh, what you see is at six and 12 months, uh, you don't see differences that relates to weight loss, that, that main outcome uh, which for which th these diets have been uh, designed and, and are uh, certainly promoted. One does not see at six months and 12 months any uh, significant uh, weight uh, difference between them, as you can see here in the blue. Uh, and really the conclusion, this comes out of a nice network meta-analysis that was done in 2014 by Bradley Johnston and colleagues, was that um, really uh, any diet that a participant's able to actually adhere to uh, that's calorie restricted uh, is likely to have advantages, which that really fits with a lot of our current clinical practice guidelines that uh, really recommend finding that dietary approach that best aligns with the values and preferences and treatment goals um, of the patient. Uh, so this was a nice network analysis done in 2014. They've since updated that. Uh, now they've gone up to 17 diets, 14 popular diets in, in over 21,000 individuals. Uh, this just came out in April, just a month ago, showing the same results here at six months between lower carb uh, and higher carb uh, here designated as low fat uh, interventions. <clears throat> so one doesn't really see uh, differences under free living conditions. And the most important determinant a benefit from any of these diets appears to be adherence. It's actually getting it past the mouth. And so really uh, finding a diet that your patients can follow. Um, another concern that has really arisen though, which I think has driven a lot of the headlines and concern, uh, it comes out of the PURE study. Um, this was a is a large uh, cohort, uh, over 100,000 individuals um, in, um, Involving uh, more than uh, almost almost 6,000 deaths in more than 18 in, in 18 countries, which is now expanded and is even bigger than that. This is an older analysis, um, which uh, showed that carbohydrate, uh, unlike uh, fat, uh, which was here broken down uh, by different sources of fat, such as total fat, saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated carbohydrate, which was not broken down and just regarded as as one. Uh, did showed an increase in mortality where you once saw a decrease in both total and cardiovascular mortality um, across the different fatty acids. Now, in fairness, it was not broken down by the source or the type of carbohydrate. Uh, and so the conclusions that really uh, came out of this in the media were that carbohydrates uh, increase uh, death. Now, one of the criticisms of this uh, particular analysis, not the study per se, but uh, by not breaking it down and not really uh, looking into it, is that 
the, meet, the, the intakes at which one saw an increased associated uh, total in cardiovascular mortality really were about 70% of calories, which given that a lot of the countries in pure were low and middle income countries, suggests that these really may have been poverty diets where there were a lot of other factors that may have contributed uh, to uh, including um, uh, deficiencies and so on that may have contributed to the increased mortality in cardiovascular uh, mortality. But the main headline that came out of this was the carbohydrates um, kill. Um, now, you, one might think that the, the story ends there, and that was from the media story, but in the exact same issue of The Lancet where this analysis was published, this analysis that grabbed so many headlines, was another paper on the Pure study, uh, an excellent paper that did not get any of the media attention, uh, which actually showed that if one does break the carbohydrate down as they did the fat, uh, one does actually see, uh, see a difference in the signals. So when one looks at very important sources of carbohydrate, in the diet, in particular, important sources from the standpoint of carbohydrate quality uh, from legumes, these are beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils, like uh, the pulses, as, as well as soy, and from fruit, one actually sees uh, the opposite. Instead of seeing increased mortality, one sees a decrease in major cardiovascular disease and uh, all cause mortality, uh, all cause mortality in, in, in both cases, <clears throat> which uh, really I think uh, is the segue I want to use to really start talking about carbohydrate quality as we move from quantity to quality, showing that even higher intakes of carbohydrate, moderate to high intakes of carbohydrate, if one emphasizes carbohydrate quality, uh, one actually sees uh, advantages and benefits and not harms, uh, which I think need to be uh, addressed. So what is the evidence? And that's uh, really the, the sort of the last part of uh, my talk here. What is the evidence linking carbohydrate uh, quality with, with health outcomes? So to answer this question, uh, what is the evidence? One has to uh, invoke an evidence-based framework, the same framework we use to inform uh, clinical practice guidelines and public health uh, recommendations. Uh, where the best evidence comes uh, from uh, randomized controlled trials uh, and our prospective cohorts. Here I've ripped off the top of the pyramid, which one usually sees, which is systematic reviews and analyses, as the thinking really is, and our thinking certainly is, that this represents best practices that relates to the synthesis of evidence. But when one talks about the hierarchy of evidence, it really relates to the units of analyses, where randomized controlled trials represent the best level of evidence, but in nutrition, really where the outcomes are intermediate biomarkers. We don't have those large clinical outcomes trials. And then the next level is the prospective cohorts where although we cannot infer causation owing to residual confounding, um, they provide the best um, evidence from those observational studies to look at those patient important, public health important clinical outcomes such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. They have sufficient longitudinal follow-up and ability to adjust uh, for uh, known and um, confounders uh, that one can have a, a measure of confidence uh, in the associations with those with those outcomes. So if we invoke that for, uh, apply that framework as it relates to carbohydrate quality, what is the evidence? And I, here I'm really focusing on three domains of carbohydrate quality, positive domains, if you like. I know uh, Luke Tappy in an earlier talk will talk about uh, different uh, the metabolic and physiological effects of different carbohydrates, talk about sugars. Here I'm talking about the positive uh, domains really as it relates to glycemic index load, dietary fiber, and food-based approaches. So what is the evidence? And we're going to do a whistle-stop tour here to really go through uh, what is the evidence to support at moderate high levels of carbohydrate intake that there is uh, benefit. So if we look at the prospective cohort studies, which really represents the floor, if you like, of our, of our evidence uh, framework. If we look at glycemic index and load, this is a really nice analysis, uh, a two-part analysis uh, published in Nutrients by Jeff Livesey uh, that was done as part of our International Carbohydrate Quality Consortium group. Uh, and what you can see here looking at glycemic index and load is that higher glycemic index and higher glycemic load scaled here for units of GI and, and GL, one sees an associated increased risk in diabetes. Uh, for glycemic index and load, and that the relative risks or the, the effect estimates are actually quite large when one looks across the full range of uh, glycemic indices. And the reciprocal is true where um, lower glycemic index and load is associated with less diabetes. One sees the same thing here as it relates to uh, coronary heart disease, a very patient important, public health important outcome. This was work that was um, commissioned uh, for the uh, EASD updates of the clinical practice guidelines for nutrition therapy through our diabetes nutrition study group. And what you can see here in this uh, paper by Livesey as well, which really focused on uh, those analyses with a truly validated dietary instrument. So a strong correlation coefficient for the um, FFQs that were used. You actually see quite nice effect estimates as it relates to glycemic index and load, again, scaled 
per 10 units of GI, and in this case for 65 grams per day of glycemic load, or higher GI, high GL is associated with higher uh, coronary heart disease. And one looks over the global a range of possible glycemic index and glycemic load using nonlinear models, you actually see very large effect sizes. So what would be considered um, upgradable uh, by grade or, or other instruments of, uh, for assessing certainty of evidence, because very large effect size is greater than two for glycemic index, greater than five uh, for glycemic load. So that's the prospective cohort. So what about the control trials looking at those intermediate biomarkers? So this was work uh, conducted uh, by my postdoctoral fellow, Lord Cavaroli. Uh, we're just in the process of publishing again, commissioned uh, by the Diabetes Nutrition Study Group to inform the uh, update of our ESD guidelines. And what you can see here, looking at trials in people with diabetes, is you see uh, reductions in HbA1c and glucose, in atherogenic aspects, lipid profile, body weight, and in inflammation. And quite clinically meaningful reductions, certainly in HbA1c, where this would meet the uh, minimum uh, clinically meaningful difference as set by the FDA for new drug development of 0.3%. Percent uh, HbA1c reduction and more moderate reductions in some of the other risk factors, uh, but certainly important uh, reductions. Uh, importantly, for glycemic index and load, and I and I should say this is also a, a case where uh, processing is important because uh, foods will have a low glycemic index, both because of the lack of processing, but also uh, such as in the case of whole pulses and fruit, which we I showed at the beginning, but also uh, because of processing. And we can think of examples like pasta or even cereals, which are uh, enriched with or added uh, viscous fibers to reduce the glycemic index and load. Importantly for um, glycemic index too, and, and going really speaking to Bradford Hill criteria for causality, we actually have a really nice biological analogy too with acrobose, which effectively converts the diet to a low glycemic index diet through inhibition of the um, alpha, of alpha glucidases uh, in, in the small intestine, uh, leading to a more prolonged absorption as opposed to the more proximal fast absorption that one sees with um, high glycemic foods with either the slow lenty um, um, absorption. And here we have evidence uh, on really patient important public health important outcomes from randomized trials showing that um, acrobose reduces both type 2 diabetes and <clears throat> CV events in the stop NIDM trial. Uh, in the more recent or subsequent ACE trial uh, with a lower dose of acrobose, they did not see the reduction in CV events, but in the earlier, uh, but did see the reduction in diabetes. But one does see reduction certainly in diabetes with a, a possibility of higher doses of reductions in CV events. So that's the evidence for GIGL. What about dietary fiber? So if we look at dietary fiber, the prospective cohorts really show looking at total fiber, and even when it's broken down by cereal fiber, fruit, and vegetable fiber, we don't really see much in the way of differences, but one looks at total fiber, one sees uh, associated reductions in diabetes and coronary heart disease. Again, here scaled per uh, grams per day of fiber um, in both analyses, one with higher intakes, one sees lower diabetes, one lower heart disease. And in the controlled feeding trials, one sees reductions in HbA1c, but in the trials, the effects appear to be restricted really to those sources of uh, fiber, which are sources of viscous or uh, soluble fibers. Uh, particularly from oats and, and barley um, in particular and, and from, from psyllium, those that have health claims for, for cholesterol lowering. But here, mixed intervention where you have uh, interventions both of mixed fiber and of these viscous fibers, one does see reductions in, in HbA1c um, and one sees reductions uh, also in um, really uh, nice reductions here in um, HbA1c as it relates to the viscous soluble fibers, specifically but more meaningful reductions that certainly meet the lower limit of efficacy of our drugs and would meet the criteria. This was an analysis we published recently in Diabetes Care. Um, and we have health claims. I'm just showing the Canadian examples, but we have health claims from the FDA and the European Food Safety Authority for um, the viscous fiber from oats uh, and barley, the beta-glucan, and from uh, psyllium. Um, when one looks at a more updated in diabetes and coronary heart disease. Um, when one looks at the controlled feeding trials, again, it appears to be more restricted to those that uh, sources of, of, of whole grains that uh, are really coming from oats and barley, those sources of viscous fiber. 
So this is showing here oats improving glycemic control in, in type 2 diabetes as a, as a source of whole grain oats. Uh, and we see here for uh, cholesterol reductions, we have whole grains mixed through to uh, rice, but really most of the uh, weight for the benefit um, coming from the oats and the barley really explaining more than 50% of, of the weight of, of for the, the benefit that's seen. So really driving that signal for a reduction in LDL cholesterol, which fits with the uh, approved health claims we have for those. Um, and reductions also in, in blood pressure. If we look at pulses, um, prospective cohort studies, uh, a very uh, capable uh, master of science student of mine put this umbrella review together for the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences. She subsequently updated it. It was just recently published, Advances in Nutrition, uh, Effie Vidruluk. Uh, and what she showed here, as you see, look, comparing the highest level of intake, the lowest extreme quantile analyses, reductions in CVD incidents, uh, coronary heart disease incidents, hypertension incidents and a tendency, although it's quite imprecise for reduction in diabetes. If we look at the controlled feeding trials, we did a series of systematic reviews and meta-analyses commissioned by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research from glycemia through body weight. Here I've put them all onto a, a super plot and summarizing all of the results, but you see uh, nice clinically meaningful reductions in HbA1c, uh, reductions in LDL cholesterol, body weight, and blood pressure um, when one looks at interventions of, of pulses. Uh, for the last sort of food-based approach to um, carbohydrate quality for the uh, fruit, if we look at the prospective cohort studies, we see a reduction here in uh, diabetes comparing um, high intakes to low intakes here scaled per one serving per day. Uh, one also sees reductions in uh, total and uh, CV mortality uh, with fruit looking at higher versus lower intakes. Uh, for the controlled feeding trials, uh, we did a, a nice analysis in the BMJ looking at food sources of sugars which actually showed that fruit was uh, showed a reduction in uh, HbA1c. So when you just restricted the analyses to, the, to interventions of fruit, you see uh, reductions in uh, glycated blood proteins, um, which are just almost uh, clinically uh, meaningful, but uh, certainly statistically significant. Uh, we see reductions in a recent systematic review meta-analysis um, on LDL cholesterol and uh, blood pressure. So for the last part of my talk, having run really through the evidence for carbohydrate quality, I just wanted to just focus a little bit uh, in terms of the implications and unintended consequences in particular. So one of the concerns around you know, this move to shift towards low carbohydrate uh, and the interest in low carbohydrate uh, is that we may revisit the low fat paradigm. And we remember very well how the food industry responded producing really a, a veritable flotilla of low um, fat foods where the replacement was with um, refined starches and sugars. So the calories didn't really change and these products weren't any healthier, but people uh, really um, really inferred that there was a health halo and, and, and in many cases were encouraged to overconsume them and we didn't really see any benefits. And there's the concern, we could see the same thing with a lot of the low carbohydrate, lower carbohydrate foods uh, sort, of, sort of being part of this, this, this interest in low carb. Um, the other thing is it may distract us from really what's important. And this is a nice analysis uh, from the Global Burden of Disease. It really uh, is a really important analysis published every couple of years. It's a large, large project. Uh, it really asks the question of all the things we need to worry about, uh, all the different risk factors, so occupational, environmental, metabolic, and lifestyle behavioral factors like nutrition, you know, what is important. And what you can see here is that carbohydrate quality markers here represent the most important determinants um, of health here as it relates to um, disability adjusted life years and, and uh, so morbidity and mortality. Uh, and none of the carbohydrate markers are associated with increased harm except for sugar sweetened beverages. They're also all associated with decreased harm where low intake of whole grains, fruit, fiber, and dairy, for example, um, are associated with uh, increased disability adjusted life years. Uh, and as well in the more recent analysis here, in legumes, showing that these important markers actually uh, really uh, emphasize the quality of carbohydrates are some of the most important out of the 15 that they've looked at risk, uh, dietary risk factors, uh, some of the most important dietary risk factors we have in the diet. And really focusing on those is what's important. What's the clinical translation? Um, well, I think the guidelines have already shifted in this way and, and moving away from the reductionist model, looking at single nutrients like carb and fat and protein towards uh, food and dietary pattern-based approaches are really capturing this, and we, we've certainly been part of that in Canada with our diabetes guidelines, cardiovascular guidelines, and our upcoming obesity guidelines. Um, these guidelines allow are quite inclusive, uh, allowing uh, one, really going back to the beginning of this talk, 
to take the advantages and disadvantages of different dietary approaches and align that with the values, preferences, and treatment goals of our patients to actually find a dietary pattern that best fits so that you can get long-term adherence and realize the benefits of these. And if you look at the patterns that we've looked at, and it's an ever-expanding number, and I'm just giving an example from our 2018 guidelines, most of these are sources of high-quality carbohydrates. And I'm just going to give you a few examples just to show you that there are many of our mainstream established dietary patterns emphasize quality carbohydrates. So the Mediterranean diet, for example, and this is the, comes from the PREDIMED trial, the PREDIMED trial score that they used to really effect a low uh, Mediterranean uh, diet within that trial, showing the importance of fruit and legumes. The DASH diet, which emphasizes fruit uh, and, as well as beans uh, and grains as a source of high quality carbohydrates and our own portfolio diet. Uh, where the plant protein sources are coming a lot from soy and, and beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils as high quality carbohydrate sources, as well as pro plant protein sources, and the viscous sticky fibers from oats, barley, and, and psyllium, as well as fruit. <clears throat> uh, the conclusions. I think there's no clear advantage of low carb over high carb. Neither one has the monopoly on the evidence. Both are main options. A focus on carbohydrate quality, so low GI, GL, food-based approaches such as whole grains, pulses, and fruit, and patterns that include these elements really, I think, uh, present the best uh, evidence uh, rather than carbohydrate quantity and provide the most robust evidence for benefit. Our clinical practice guidelines are already there and really emphasizing quality over quantity, allowing for more inclusive range of, of intakes of macronutrient distribution, emphasizing uh, really uh, quality over quantity. And it, as adherence is one of the most important determinants of the benefit of any diet, uh, it's really incumbent on health professionals to advise patients on the diet that best, the evidence-based diets that best align with the values, preferences, and treatment goals of their patient. So with that, I just want to acknowledge some of the sponsors of our work and thank the great work of a lot of uh, the, the trainees that have gone to the lab that, that helped in generating a lot of these data. Thank you.